At the center of the universe, at the border between the light and the dark, stands Castle Grayskull. For countless ages, the heroes of Grayskull have defended the universe against the forces of evil. Walk through the Hall of Living Pictures and learn the history and mystery of the masters of the universe. Dive deep into the mythology of Eternia, Etheria, and more. For those who know the stories of Grayskull will come the power. The power to be supreme. The power to be all-knowing. The power to be Legends of Grayskull. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three and a half of Legends of Grayskull. <laughs> The fan podcast where we talk the history and the mystery, the magic and the mythology of He-Man, She-Ra, Master Universe, Princess of Power, Princesses of Power, New Adventures, Galactic Guardians, Evil Mutants, Evil Horde, UK Annuals, Golden Books, Kid Stuff Books, Record Books, uh, and DC Comics. I am Matthew Dooch. I'm here with Sean Skavarna. Sean, how are we doing today? I am always mesmerized by that intro, and every time it's fresh. I love it. I love it. Keeps me I on my try, toes. I try. I <laughs> try. So, as most of you know, the format of our show is we take some sort of lore from one of the associated Masters of the Universe properties, um, and we discuss it in depth. Uh, for our full episodes, there are zero point zero episodes. We talk about some sort of a show. And for our half episodes or .5 episodes, we talk about literature. Um, so for today, we decided to go recent. Um, we've got He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse. It is coming out right now from DC Comics. It is a six-issue miniseries. And right now, uh, mm -hmm. issue three just released a couple weeks ago. So mm -hmm. we thought this would be a good point to kind of jump in. Uh, it's the halfway point of the series. And kind of get our thoughts, our likes, our dislikes um, over it, and talk a little bit about what we what we think's coming and what we hope to see coming. Um, yeah. So, Sean, you you've been picking all these up as they came out, right, month to month. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I don't do that normally, so there you go. Um, I I'm I'm very curious. Like uh, everybody likes to equate it to the turtles um multi crossover that they did in the cartoon i think at least twice yes. now and uh the into the spider verse uh spider-man sony mm -hmm. movie from a couple years ago which was amazing so here we are we finally got all these different iterations of he-man and the mythologies of he-man all getting boiled down episode or issue to issue not episode to episode right. um and each issue is different um, continuity of the Masters of the Universe lore at this point. Absolutely. So. And so basically the basic premise is it's following Anti-Eternia He-Man, who is a character that originated from the German audio plays and, and only one German audio play. He was from a Mirror Universe uh like Eternia's, but the I should have just looked him up before we started here with our wonderful character compendium and world guide. <laughs> so make sure I'm getting this because I have actually never. I know there's, I know there's an English translation out there, but I have never actually listened to the German audio plays myself. I so, have not either. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a short little, uh, paragraph here. Um, so, so I'll just read it right quick. Uh, from 1984, the German audio plays, uh, Anti-He-Man was the master of Anti-Eternia, a hellish world located in the universe of darkness. The evil counterpart to He-Man, Anti-He-Man had black skin and red hair. He was completely evil and undefeated in combat. He would raise his sword and call upon the power of Hell Grayskull. Anti-He-Man entered Eternia when Skeletor built a world converter and used it to open an interdimensional gate between the two realities. Uh, instead of joining forces with Skeletor, Anti-He-Man threw him out of Snake Mountain. He later challenged He-Man to combat. 
Anti-He-Man vanished when Man-at-Arms and Skeletor destroyed the world converter. Um, so yeah, that's that's all we really have for Anti-He-Man Vintage. I know Classics did a couple more things with him um, and whatnot, but... Uh, and then it does say when when Anti He Man was released in the classics uh, action figure line, they changed Hell Gray Skull to Hell Skull, which I believe is how it's referred to in these DC comics. Yes, yeah, and um, uh, he up until I found I never knew about this until probably three years ago, to be honest, and um, I knew he was a chase figure in the line. And he was one of those figures everybody wanted to get their hands on anytime they put him on Maddie Collector. Yeah. And then it turned into this, you know, he's a fan favorite now. And mm-hmm. now it's become, here's him being able to be the ultimate villain in this, you know, multi-issue event they're doing at this point. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'll, I'll start it out with a quick opinion. The concept of anti-He-Man scares the living hell out of me. Absolutely. Um, he is the sort of a character that the, 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 the kind of villains that really give me the creeps are the ones that you can't reason with. You cannot logically go up to them and talk out what is the reason or the reasons why they should not do what they're doing. This is like I, I picture before I read these, I pictured him as this force that just cannot be stopped. He is like the juggernaut in a sense, but with He-Man's abilities. Right. And I also pictured him as a character that probably did not speak very much. He just struck me as unsettling in that way as well. So going into this event after not, I'd never went to the audio plays. I, um, I knew the bits and pieces that I knew through groups online or mm-hmm. through, you know, the, the little bit like the summary that you read and I was like, okay, how are they going to do this? How are they going to make this character, this character here? Because this is like, legitimately, this is the first time American and other audiences get to actually have this character in any kind of literature form for mass consumption. Right. Um, and I, I got to say, the, the way he's depicted in here is not quite the way I was viewing him, which made it kind of... I don't want to say it was a letdown. It was just I had expectations, and when they weren't achieved and they were subverted by the way it was done, I was a little like, already I got my head cannon going on saying, well, this is a, this is a version of it, but my version is scarier. My version right. is eviler <laughs> or more evil or whatever. Yeah, uh, the, for me, I, like I said, I never saw – I never heard the German audio play. Um and it's just a character. He's got a cool design, but for me, with him only being in that one story officially, um, and not really, I never got the figure. Uh, it's just a character I didn't pay much attention to. Not whether he's that good or a bad character. Just you know, he he didn't resonate with me uh, the way character from my childhood would, and there just wasn't enough about him to go out and you know, it, it was one story. And mm-hmm. I never, and I never bothered looking it up. Um, I probably put the most interest into him since this cro- this whole series was announced. Um, but the, but here again, I just wanted to point out his actual origins because I know there's a lot of confusion because he has been a popular character for the German fans all these years, and there's been a lot of fan fiction about him. There's been a lot of you know, like you said, message boards and everything about him. Where mm-hmm. people have thrown different things in and maybe got an idea of him, well, like in your case, that may not actually be true or may not be re- represented here. Yeah. Um, not saying there's anything wrong with that. Everyone's, you know, everyone's head canning is valid. I won't, I won't deny that. Yeah. But so, so basically this mini series is following him trying to take all the powers of Grayskull and all the multiverse all the different Eternias, all the different incarnations of He-Man. I love this concept. Like you said, it's it's into the Spider-Verse crossed with, you know, the Turtles mm-hmm. crossed with Crisis on Infinite Earths. It's, mm-hmm. 
the part that I love the most, and it's what I've said for years and kind of what I just said a second ago, is every canon is valid to me. Even mm-hmm. if I don't personally like it, every canon is valid. I, not to get into too much of a tangent, but I prefer this, making every canon, every continuity its own universe, rather than those times they've tried to piece uh, continuities together. Um, Because there's a lot of continuities that conflict. And when those are forced together, and I'll say it, with most of the classic bios, Mm. that line tried to really force some pieces together that don't go together. To me, you can't have, say, two halves of the power sword and have had Adam become He-Man with the power sword. It just, they're too conflicting. They cause too many problems. I mean, you you can get there, and like the classics bio did. They said, well, Adam hunted down both halves, combined them, and then he started transforming. But it, it, it's, it's, it's messy to me, and that's just my personal mm-hmm. opinion. Um, but I like mm-hmm. this saying that, you know, these worlds are separate, but they're still valid, and I think that's the best way to handle it, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I mean, you know, for somebody who, you know, will likes filmation for instance, mm-hmm. at least you get a representation of that in this compared to somebody, you know, like it, basically it's it's not saying any of them aren't valid. I mean, heck, we even get sideshow He-Man right. in this. There there's all different iterations and I almost uh, I'm almost overwhelmed by that part of it to be completely honest because then there's a certain amount of so basically our loyal subjects their own continuity yeah is this because we have tappers yeah, and we'll, i know we'll get that's a that's a character i know you're you're like that guy but i'm just saying when you have a video game character then you have all this and then you have it, it's like there there's almost a point where you kind of say it's too much yeah. and it's only six issues that we're talking about so in that way it's almost like you know they do focus each issue on individual things yeah. which helps but even six issues of this i feel like it needed to be bigger than even six issues maybe to accomplish something like this give a little more breathing room right. at times especially when you're bringing in like you said like video games like to me for this they should have narrowed it down as to what constitutes a universe and what doesn't um i i agree with that actually because it, it, it filmation could be its own that's not right. a problem the movie one could be its own 2000x right. new adventures beyond that if there isn't a lot of literature about it i'm a little like why would yeah. they include this well even, even honestly even the sideshow like sideshow is a line of statues they're very yeah. nicely designed statues i don't well i don't care for them nor can i afford them so, yeah. but, like, that to me is not a universe. Um, and basically they're here just for fodder. Um, but, yeah, I would I would have preferred, I'll say that right off the bat, I would have preferred it to a little tighter, a little mm-hmm. more exclusive on what constitutes a universe. Um, and not tangent, because we'll get to it eventually, but it, it's the same problem I had in uh I don't know if you remember if you, you read the Eternity War, right? The other mm-hmm. comic. Yep. I have. It was either during the Eternity War or the lead up to that in the He Man and the Masters of the Universe that DC did. But during that DC series, there was a point where Skeletor was talking to She Ra and he's saying, you know, I traveled to all these different dimensions. There was always a Skeletor and he always got beaten by He Man. And like they did like these little glimpses into these worlds in like bubbles. Mm-hmm. And there was like, there, I think there was 2000 X Skeletor and there were some unused concept Skeletors. And then in one of the bubbles, they had the action figure, the eighties action figure of Skeletor. And I'm just sitting there going like, why, why? <laughs> Cause it's Skeletor. It's too meta. Right. Too it's meta too, it's too much. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah. so Skeletor's traveling through dimensions and finds this world where he's just an action figure. Like that's literally our world. Why didn't he just stay and conquer us? Like, yeah, that's a good option. <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing there. It's like you went just a smidge too far. So yeah, um, but let's dive into it here. Let's let's tear yep, up this let's first issue. 
Let's do it. Let We're me not, grab mine. So here. if you guys haven't read this or haven't read this in a while, uh, go ahead. It's the point where I where I freeze and say go back, listen to or watch, read it. God, I cannot talk today. <laughs> go read it. Come back to us. We'll wait. So you got any any big plans tonight, Sean? I'm just gonna reread these. Okay. <laughs> no, honestly, I'm gonna do art. There we go. All right, That's they should have had do. time now. Yeah, anyway, what, what took you so long, people? God, you were really so. reading that slow. <laughs> so, yeah, so we start off here. The first issue basically is just an introduction. Um, it starts off with anti-turn. I'll give, I'll give a big overview of the whole issue, just the basics here, and then we'll kind of dig into what we liked, disliked. Um, so it starts off with anti-attorney He-Man appearing on the Sideshow universe based on those statues. You know, he easily dispatches He-Man and Skeletor, takes the power sword for himself. After that, you're basically uh, just introduced. The rest of it's just introducing yourself to the anti world. Um, this is where. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this is where most of the world is kind of flip flopped. Uh, Randor's still king, uh, but uh, but Keldor's good. Triclops is good. Trapjaw, Evil, and Beastman. Most of your evil warriors are on the side of good. And in, in this world, it's like, so what we see is He-Man and Tila notably are evil. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of taking it and flipping on its head where it seems, and they don't go into great detail on the origin of anti-He-Man, but uh, it seems like basically Adam took the power of Grayskull and turned evil as opposed to, you know, most of our normal continuities where Keldor goes evil. So that seems to be the big difference. A um, little while later, Keldor uh, uh, is visited by the... <laughs> it's kind of like a, a Christmas story that he's visited by yeah. two ghosts, but uh, they're two He-Mans. He-Mens, He-Men. Uh, the Tappers He-Man and the 87 movie, the Dolph Lundgren-based He-Man. And they explain that anti-Eternia He-Man... It, he's he's set out to conquer the multiverse. He's traveling from Eternia to Eternia, stealing the powers of Grayskull and everything. Um, he they they used the cosmic key to escape him, and now they're trying to uh, they're trying to find a way to stop him. Uh, and they've come yeah. here because this is the only universe here on Anti-Eternia where He-Man is evil. He-Man is a force for good in all of the multiverse except for this Earth. So they need to figure out, uh, they feel that this is the key to undoing him. And specifically Keldor, because this is the only universe where Keldor did not turn to the forces of evil turn into Skeletor that there must be some, there must be a reason for that. It must be the yin yang type of thing is what I gathered. Um, mm -hmm. And then they set off uh, into the multiverse with Keldor. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. So let's uh, first off with, with the big thing I liked in this issue is the fact that it was not a straight flip on anti-Eternia. It wasn't just all the bad guys are good and all the good guys is bad. Um, I, there's, there's some shades here, which I, which mm -hmm. I liked. Like I said, Randor's still here. Um, and I get the feeling that He-Man is still Adam. I don't think they actually come out and say it. Um, but like I said earlier, it feels like this, the, like, it's it just flipped the script. Um, yeah, and that Randor doesn't control the whole world. He's ba basically there. This group of heroic warriors, which I like, I said includes Triclops, Trapjaw, Evil, and Panthers. There, Screech is there. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's really neat that they're that they pretty much just control Eternal City, and Anti He Man controls basically the rest of the world. Um, let me see if I can find the... Yeah, here's a quote from Keldor. Uh, when Randor wants to go attack uh, Castle Hellskull because anti attorney He-Man has, 
has seemingly gone missing. They haven't seen him in a while. Um, he says, perhaps there is something unusual occurring at that cursed keep. Perhaps now is the time to strike and save Eternia from that dark menace. Uh, for justice, for revenge. But if it isn't, you'll put what little we have at risk. Are you willing to let this city suffer the same fate as so many close to you? As your daughter, hey, Shira, uh, uh -huh. as your son, yeah. as your wife. We've saved who we who can be saved, brother. We are powerless, but we are alive. Um, so I think that basically sums up this world. They made a lot of sacrifices. Somehow they managed to keep the city under their control, but that's it. And there's been yeah. a lot of loss. And he doesn't necessarily say they're dead either. So, I mean, you could you could also posit that in this world, Shira might even have turned to the dark side as well. Or maybe she is dead. Maybe Marlene is dead. Um, but as your son, I take that as, you know, he's turned to the forces of evil. So I, I like that, that they didn't just... It's, it's the easy way out to just flip the script completely. But they went for a little nuance here, which I appreciate. I think the thing about that is... I almost feel like that would be a hell of a more compelling story at times because here we are getting snippets, each issue of individual canons that we enjoy, but there is a whole story going on in the background on the anti Eternia mm -hmm. that really, I, I would be really interested to see what happened. Right. Because, you know, like it, in the case of, um, in the case of masters, usually it's the sorceress handing the sword to Adam and he, he calls upon the power and he becomes he man. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of, okay, what is the deal at hell skull right. in, in my head? You know? So like that whole thing is way more creepy to me because it almost feels like it's a contamination of these people. Yeah. It's like, they weren't necessarily evil and now they're contaminated by this orb at, at the pit of Hell Skull, and now like Teal is messed up from it right. and contaminated, and and He Man and everything. So you know, like I like that it opens the door to your mind going into what could have happened to them to lead it to this point. But like you said, like when we open the book, the opening a uh, couple pages is Skeletor doing his typical, you know, he's about to take over Grayskull and he's standing there in front of Grayskull. So when we see him, I just took it as Skeletor. Yeah. So, you know, for me being an artist, I'm really bad at looking at things at first <laughs> glance and going, oh, there's details here to make you think it's something else. Mm -hmm. But I didn't notice it was Sideshow. And then when we see Adam and Sorceress, it looks like the traditional Adam and Sorceress. Yeah, there's a and there's a little bit of tweaks, a little more embellishment. A little bit. But yeah, basically. A little bit, yeah. So it, it took me a little bit to go, oh, we're in the Sideshow universe. Mm -hmm. And then when we see all this other stuff, it's like, I, I feel like everything with the first issue, it sets it up, but I never get a moment to kind of let it sink in of this is what the story really is. It's like, uh, you know, one minute, one thing happens and boom, then the next, then right. the next, then the next. And this is something you and I were going to compare and contrast using this yes. actually is the, the difference between to tempt the gods, mm -hmm. the 1980s uh, first issue of the miniseries versus how stories are told today, because that miniseries is like a hearty meal. Yes. That, that first issue has so many facets to it. It took us an hour just to talk about that one issue. Mm -hmm. This, we're going to talk about three issues probably in under an hour probably. at this point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's like there's a lot of breakneck pacing, but I feel like I don't get enough time to breathe in any of those places. Yeah. And, and really, they're just not a lot of story. And that's, you know, you can find many podcasts about that. We're not going to dive too deep, but it's it's the decompressed storytelling it's yep. the modern way that they're writing for the trade, uh, the trade book, um, the story arcs. I know uh, a few people who are waiting to read any of this until all six issues are out, you know, because mm -hmm. that's when they get the full story. And I even told yep. Sean months ago, I said, well, I'm going to I'm not going to pass judgment until I read the whole story. And I'm still not going to today. I'll give a rating on these first three, but it's going to be a tenuous one. Because these the last three are going to influence it because it's all one story instead mm -hmm. of how they used to write where they made up 
three stories that made an arc, and each story had its own beginning, middle, and end. Uh, this is very much the beginning, and not even really all the beginning. Uh, you get very little information. There's a lot of nuggets here. Um, but uh, but there's not a whole lot of meat here. Mm -hmm. it, it jumps around. I like the I like the Keldor Randor dynamic here again. Keldor is good, but he's still he's he's making fun of Randor. He's undermining him. You still get that this is kind of Keldor at heart. That he's not a hundred percent happy, but the way this universe has ran its course, he's still technically a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't resorted to doing. I mean, his his world has made it that he can't mm -hmm. at this point, which is actually funny to me. There is an evil that trumped him becoming evil mm -hmm. for that reason, and you know, so like if that wasn't a case, he probably would be the typical Skeletor, maybe in this in this universe. But this Hell Skull and everything yeah. else is it, it it completely walloped him. So he's now the side of the angels in this case yeah. but and they um and they do say here just to go on the other part they did say that captain tila was in undisputed eternal's territory and that that's a violation of the treaty with the dark quarters so here mm -hmm. again like you said that's i want to hear about that i want to hear about the yeah. battle leading up to the treaty of the dark quarters like that's there's a story um well, exactly i mean the the whole thing uh, the whole thing to me has this really creepy eerie factor to it because you know anytime that you have somebody who's a huge force for good and you turn it around to say and, and that barely ever happens like yeah. bizarro to superman is a whole different deal than something like this where it's flat out he man is normally a force for good and now all of a sudden we have this completely opposite version right. of him what does that mean how evil can this guy get right. you know and what has he done to his, his world and they were lucky enough that Eternos is the, the – that's the line. Mm -hmm. Like that to me is a whole – like what has been sacrificed to make that even happen in this story? Absolutely. But we don't get to do that. We get to focus more on – now we have, yeah. uh, like you said, the the uh, Tappers He-Man and the uh, Dolph Lundgren He-Man showing up. And it's the whole Christmas Carol aspect yeah. where, you know, hey, we need your help. You know, come with us. We have this problem. And we get to see a certain character who is loved slash hated from the movie is only a hologram now and no longer yeah. even in the mythology of this book. Uh, There's a lot of killing. There, there, there is. That's the one thing. There, there is. It's like we're mowing people down left and right, they are. basically. And I, I will say here, I forgot about this. Uh, Tila is the one who for, she puts a little bit of doubt into Keldor's mind or a little something to think about. Uh, she says that she has been... I have been to the bowels of Hellskull before the orb yeah. of Mars. I appeared into the infinite universe contained within. In every one of those worlds, it's you who is the ultimate evil lord of destruction, Keldor. So she kind of plants a little seed of where this is going. So so instead of the orb of, of knowledge or the orb of wisdom or whatever continuity you want to look at, there's always kind of an orb there, even from the early golden books they had in there. Uh, 2000X did a lot with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this one, it's the orb of horror is what the, what it shows these people drives them mad. It taints them. I've got to imagine that both Tila and He Man looked like their regular versions before coming in front of this orb. Um, That's what I figured too. And, yeah, and I like I like the character designs here. Before we get to the end of the issue, um, the Trap Jaw he's got a real like clean color scheme, a very Eternian guard color scheme with the orange yeah. armor, a green loincloth, uh, blue mm -hmm. helmet. Uh, Triclops and Beast Man, uh, same thing. Triclops has that that typical Eternal Scarred um, mm -hmm. color scheme, and Beast Man they used the old Red Beast, uh, which yeah. is right above Sean's head there, uh, right over here. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Evil Lynn, she's got a really clean outfit. I, I like that they did enough to the same thing, even even just instead of a straight color swap like the characters just kind of look more heroic if that makes sense beast man's got yeah. a little friendlier face than normal um screech looks but, noble so but there's still the characters we know and hate or love you know and i even like uh i didn't notice this um at first but even uh keldor has a hoodie so I like the idea that, you know, if he wanted to go bad, he could actually pull the hood up and he could almost yeah, he does, go like, you know. that's it. That's your little nod to, you know, Skeletor having the hood and all that stuff. So it's well, it's still there in the design. I think that's kind of fun. And the rest of the design, uh, 
swap that vest to a red or a pink, and you've got the Adam design. Exactly, he did a mashup on yeah, that. Yeah, it's got the, the it's got, Dan Frega. It's got the cut uh, vest there, um, mm -hmm. and the white sleeves. And yes, I probably should have let. I always do this like when we're already into it. But yes, uh, oh, Tim the... Seeley's the writer. Dan <laughs> Frega's the inker. Richard Friend is. Oh my God, they don't. No one ever puts a title page on the friend anymore. You notice well, that in modern it, comics? Yeah, it's it's uh, Dan Frege is the the penciler, Pencil. and then Tim or uh, Richard Friend is the uh, inker. Yeah. Colors by if Matt Yaki. Yep. Uh, letters by Seda Tamafante. I'm sure I butchered that. I'm sorry. Uh, and the cover of the first issue was In Hick Lee. Um, but yeah, they 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 did a nice job there, and I know you've been lucky enough to talk to Dan Fraga. Um, yeah. Over at and, Council, uh, the first ones. Yeah, and you know he. Uh, like uh, I knew of his stuff in the '90s, and and uh, he was part of the image explosion yeah. and all that. And uh, it was it was really crazy to go, wow, you know, he's he's on a master's book in this way. Um, and honestly, like I feel there are people that were. I'll be completely honest, yeah. and I'm, I'm not trying to be a, a jerk to Mr. Frega at all. The first issue didn't wow me though, like yeah. uh, from an artistic standpoint. There's something about the inks that. For me, it makes his line work kind of muddy or something. I, I don't know the best way to describe it. So help, help, help me and the viewers out here because I always get this backwards, not being an artist. Uh, it's pencils first and then inks mm -hmm. and then colors, right? Yeah, usually um, it, 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 pen, it, the layouts can be done however, and then the penciling, uh, and then either the artist will – We'll ink it so that it's embellished and then it's easier for printing purposes. There are artists out there that do pencils and that's it. Mm. But when you see those, the pencils usually aren't quite as defined. Right. So it'll be a muddier piece of artwork. I, I feel like there was almost too much line work in the inking that made it almost like I, I feel like I'm looking at something that could be great. But then it's like almost undefined because there's too many lines. Right. And I'm not trying to, to be a jerk to any of the artists because Lord knows they're doing it professionally and I'm not. But I I just felt like there was a certain impact missing from his artwork if maybe they they were a little cleaner about it, I, I the, the inking and stuff. Right. So that's my one big thing about you know the art in the first issue. The second issue, I feel like it kind of took off and ran better. Yeah. Um, but, I also but yeah, I – Go ahead. I just want to say right quick while we're on it, I know that has been a big complaint of a lot of it. I didn't mind this first issue because it was, to me, it did feel very image, very 90s. Um, yeah, it feels very, very 90s. even uh, uh, MV Creations comics. I might get slapped by some fans for that. But it, <laughs> uh, the colors especially in the anti-universe, I felt those colors were very much like what they were doing there. And uh, I think Val Staples did the coloring back then. I want to say. Um, I know. He I'm does, pretty sure. I know he does. he does a lot of coloring. I don't know if he did the whole way through. Um, I did like. It's not as pronounced in this first issue um, as it is in two, and especially issue three. But if you look at the issues together, um, there's a bit of a different tone, like you said, for each of them. Um, the mm -hmm. sideshow pages look a little different artistically than the anti-Eternia pages. Anti-Eternia mm -hmm. is a little cleaner even, it seems to me, whereas sideshow, um, to me, that's some crazy, like, I guess you would say the line art, but I'm no mm -hmm. artist, so I usually, this is where I'm usually like, yeah, it's pretty or it's not pretty. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to well, be a little um, more specific than that. But then you go to, like, the second issue and the third issue, and especially what we see where they go in the fourth issue, it's very, they try, even though, and I did double check, most of this is the same artist through the first three issues here as far as the penciler, the inkler, inkers, and the colors. Um, there's still just a little different feel, like you said. It's a little, the line art's a little cleaner in issue two and all that. So. Yeah, I feel like, basically, when I when I got to talk to, him, to uh, Dan Frega, he was saying, you know, he hasn't been on a comic in years. Mm -hmm. So getting back on this, it was like, you know, he was getting back in the saddle again for the first time in a while. So that's why, like, the first issue to me, mm -hmm. 
I don't feel like it was a bad issue, but I feel like it was a warm up issue. And then issue two, there was more of like firing on all cylinders with the representations because the other thing is he was using a lot of references in these, these uh, books. And I think like, the first issue, the references weren't nearly as no. ready, readily accessible. Whereas the second issue, if you look at how he draws in, um, New Adventure Skeletor, mm-hmm. it's gorgeous. Right. Like anybody who didn't like issue one, I'd actually take them to see issue two and three and go, yeah, yeah but look at how he rendered uh, New Adventure Skeletor. It's like every time he shows up in a panel, it's almost like they put a spotlight on yeah. him and it's like – Look at this, and it really looks glorious. Same with uh, 2000X and issue three. Yep. He did a really good job of like making that Skeletor head look like the action figure. He was using a right. lot of those references. Because, and for me, I enjoyed that. Right. And that's why I wanted to start off with what I did reading anti Eternia He-Man's bio, because this whole world we're in hasn't existed before. It's existed in fan fiction. It's existed, mm-hmm. you know, and us fans have, have speculated um, but none of that really existed. So yeah, I, so I think, well, I know you're right. Cause you've talked to the man. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I felt the same way reading this is, is yeah, pretty much this where make, he's making it up. And I think he did a good job. Like I, like I said, on those characters, did you guys specifically ask them if it was his intention to do slightly different for like art style for each I don't think he was tr- – like I don't think it was intended that way. I know he was more uh, wanting to really make each version of them like proper. Yeah. You know, He was really interested in achieving the look so that as a fan you're not looking at it and going, well, he wasn't even looking at this to draw it right. or he doesn't know what he's doing. And you know, like it, that I think comes through a lot. Although when you look at the um, – the Dolph Lundgren he man, I feel like now that we have the uh, William Stout collection out mm-hmm. there, there's fans out there who are going to be looking at that figure and looking at all the crazy design work yeah. in that in that armor. And it's like he did as best as he could, looking at like different images to try to get all that the armor the proper way from the movie yeah, and stuff. I can't imagine anybody uh, animating or drawing all that detail that basically I, I that can't they either. just had to sculpt. <laughs> Once and, and be done with it, and that's that's the thing. Uh, I know talking to him, he was saying the same thing about the 2000x designs. Yeah. Which, as somebody who has done commissions of 2000x work, I can tell you it's gorgeous to look at and it's amazing to look at from the horseman. But dear God, if you're drawing that panel to panel to panel, you're putting probably two to three times the amount of effort into that rendering than it would be to draw the typical one in some ways because of the amount of detail they put in. Which is, so, which is why the cartoon never was the full detail no. of the of the action figures. It, it was a representation and that was it. But you have these artists now who, like Emiliano yeah. and everyone else, where it's like they want to draw every little yes. facet of stuff and it's like, God bless them. Yes. That's a, and we, that's a heck of and a And I know we will talk about that once we... Uh, once we start doing some MVC comics, I know we'll talk yes. about that because Emiliano is a very talented artist and he had a lot of specific ideas about that comic. So Yes. Um, but, but, uh, but to finish up issue one here, I mean, it's, it's you know, they explain what's happening to, to Keldor. He's he's a little, you know, like whatever. Um, almost, I, honestly, I even kind of got a, a, a feel like Adam in the 2000 X series where he's kind of like, you know, why me, you know, I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm nothing. Um, so the parallels were neat. Um, we got, uh, uh, like you said, Gwildor's there as a recording telling him what he's found out. He was, it was very princess Leia R2D2 where he's struck down basically in front of the recording by anti attorney, he man. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, but Gwildor's calculated that Keldor is the only one who can stop him and take the anti-power sword and return the power to the rightful realms. And right there, that's where, that's why I'm okay with the killing. Because in these kind of infinite earths, crossover, multiverse things... I feel like you can kill Gwildor here and still have it be all right at the end. Mm-hmm. 
either they can restore everything how it was before. And he said he's re returned the power to the rightful realms, which theoretically could undo what anti he man's done. Um, I'm okay with the shameless killing in these types of crossovers. If at the end, everything's returned to a type of status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, for me, I guess I just kind of felt it, it puts more into the Dolph Lundgren He-Man for me then, mm -hmm. because he's the one that has the exposure to the cosmic key and he's kind of like the point man now in this adventure. And it's kind of cool to go, okay, the movie has been panned. The movie is now like this cult movie out there that some fans love. Some fans still to this day think is ridiculous or horrible, but they're giving him that due finally in this book where it's like, you're going to be the head of this little group trying to set everything right. right. And him doing, using the key, which he didn't even use in the movie. He was just trying to find it in the right. movie. And now he's the guy leading them using the key I think that's an interesting dynamic mm -hmm. um, to take his character in this. So yeah. I, I really enjoyed that he got his due. No, and it's and it's the right thing, and that shows me. I mean, in a minute here, we'll get to some where I feel they didn't do enough research, but for this first issue on its own, I felt they did enough research to write a good story. They had enough nods to things that have happened, using the cosmic key as a device to bridge the, the multiverse for the heroes. Um, mm -hmm. And it gave a good reason as to why some of these other He-Men didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will ask you right quick. Um, so do you think... Using the camera there. Which He-Man do you think that is? Uh, let me grab mine. That's the one with, where it shows like all the carnage. Yeah, where it shows him over. in front of... Anti-He-Man in front of Hell Skull. And uh, and I've missed this on the first read through. I wasn't really paying that much attention, but looking at it now, I'm thinking that's our DC uh, comics. I I do think it's that. Only I'm just curious why the coloring is different because I would have figured he would have been a blue tunic. True. That's um, the only thing. But we have the sorceress looking like the goddess now. Yeah. Or, or I'm sorry, not the Tila looking like the goddess. Okay. Yeah, it could, and, it could be the goddess. Yeah. It could be Tila. It could be even the, the early golden books. You know, they usually use Tila mm -hmm. and her snake armor. Um, but just one more universe they flashed on briefly, but that we so we obviously won't see after this. I, I honestly, I don't think they'll do it, but it would be interesting if in the graphic novel they actually did a director's cut where in the back they might actually tell you who the different versions yeah. are in these little parts because it does, like, it looks like the DC one, like we talked about, but there's still elements that are a little off that make me go, right. well, maybe that's probably not him. The one thing I want to say really quick before we move on to is hell skull itself on that page. The, the one that you just showed off. Yeah. Now, um, this has that. Yeah, go ahead. There we go. That is, um, we, we brought that up actually on the other podcast mm -hmm. and, um, that actually is fan art that, uh, Dan Frega actually thought was legit uh, mm -hmm. licensed art. Right. And so he used it thinking that that's how it really should look. And then it turned out it was fan art and he had to reach out to the creator mm -hmm. to get the okay to put it in there because it's never there. There, there is a vague description of hell skull, yep. but it's not yeah. in, you know, like anywhere illustrated other than that fan art. Yep. Exactly. And, uh, and I think uh, the artist's name is Simon Eckert yep, exactly. was the one that uh, created it originally. And I, I got to tell you, like the the little layers that we're getting into on this anti attorney thing make it creepier the more we get into it. Because that face for a castle would never like that's like it, it almost has that doll face look about it, which is like my wife is creeped yeah. out by that. And even in that case, it's like. I would never go there. Like Castle Grey Skull, I would want to live in compared to that thing. Like that just, ugh. It, it, it looks unholy as anything. It just looks so right. wrong. And I know, and I and like I know how the that looks. Vague description came from the audio, but they said it had a beautiful face as opposed mm -hmm. to Grey Skull, which is a menacing face. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was that was interesting too. That he he, and I know that was a little bit of an uproar. Uh, I was just trying to see. You know what's weird is that Hell Skull does not have an entry in 
the compendium. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's that's weird. Because I was gonna, I was gonna. Oh wait, maybe, maybe it's under Castle. Yeah, I looked Castle first because yeah, oh, that's where okay. Castle Grayskull and Castle High Point, Castle of King Jared. Um, yeah, weird. Maybe because hmm. there was no drawing of it because it's very this book very much uses pictures. Um, all right. Yeah, I just thought I. Oh wait, German search. Yes, yeah, and I even listed under the German audio place. So, hmm. so yeah, that shows how little was there was about this anti Eternia. And yes, I did. Hmm. I was going to bring that up there. Um, so that's that's hopefully, and obviously the guy was okay with it, um, mm -hmm. using it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of neat to get some validation there of your fan art. Um, oh yeah, I mean honestly, like if you look at the art that the guy created, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's I have seen it's that. definitely yeah. worth a look um, for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it paints an interesting picture of what this anti Eternia, uh, is yep. and what they're up against. And then on top of that, it's the call to arms. It's mm -hmm. the call to adventure for the main character in this issue. And that's pretty much off and running to the races of new adventures. Absolutely. That's where we're heading next. Um, and basically the last page there is them showing up on Starship Eternia in the middle of a battle. Um, uh, here we go. Issue two. Issue two. This is the one where I was like, I, I, ugh. Basically, the, the art in this is amazing, but nothing story-wise happens. Um, there's a nice moment here. Basically, they're racing around the starship, just trying to find where anti eternity he mans going to pop out. Uh, they meet some of the mutants. I don't think they really meet any of the guardians, per se. Um, and then they're too late. Oh, they meet Ske New Adventure Skeletor, which is the only part I liked was the interaction between Skeletor and Keldor, especially as being the first Skeletor that Keldor's met. Yep. Um, and then they reach the power core too late. anti eternity He-Man gets the power, and... He leaves. And that's that's pretty much <laughs> it. Um, Sean, why don't you start off? You what, what do you have positive about this? We'll start with that. Well, positive, like I said, this issue, for me, like any, any problems somebody might have had about the first issue with the artwork, this one kind of slams them in the face, in my opinion, because... Yes. It, from the get go, it, like the the stuff I was saying, where the line work kind of made other things dis indistinguishable in the first one, there was too too many lines. This one, it's cleaner, it, it's more concise. There's there's a lot more emotion in the characters' faces. Like even even uh, in here, just if I can position myself there we go if it um uh, like right here just the look of yeah. concern on he-man's face we wouldn't have seen that in the first issue because the inking and, and the pencils are kind of like working in concert a lot better um even i i really like this um this image too yeah, i'm having the hardest yeah, time all right the, even too. even here where you have the look of new new adventures he-man and he's kind of having this moment of thinking about what he has to do next. And yeah, um, I really, really was impressed with that. And then, and the, the star, no matter what is a uh, new adventure Skeletor mm -hmm. here, he, and, and I'm going to get this eventually. I promise. Yeah. There we go. Uh, he, anytime that uh, Dan Frega draws him and he admitted that was his favorite Skeletor. Like that's his favorite iteration. Um, you can tell he puts in a lot of time on that yes. character in that issue. Um, and there's a lot of details all throughout the issue and it would have driven me crazy to draw something like that <laughs> for all those pages. So, uh, you know, I, I feel the pain of that. I, the second issue made me actually kind of more interested in new adventures than I had been because it put it, it, it took enough time in new adventures for me to be invested to a certain point. 
and just go like, I need to revisit some of this a lot more. Like we did our, our uh, lost episode yes, we with did. the echo <laughs> and, uh, and that made me also go, Hey, I never gave this as much credit or as much time as I ever did. Um, but I think the last thing I want to say really quick, and then I'll let you go completely into what you want to, I promise, no, go ahead. is this issue reminds me of the shuttle sequence in Transformers the movie where the Decepticons yeah. board the shuttle at the beginning of the movie. Because that's basically what it amounts to where, you know, you have all the villains there, anti attorney is on board. It also reminds me of Alien, too, because you're in a, a ship. There's this thing that's out to get you and all that kind of stuff. And at the very end, when you see New Adventures He-Man get killed, there is a certain amount of like one prowl got shot and you see the eyes dimming and yeah. the smoke coming out of his mouth. That's kind of how I felt watching that death. I was like, I kind of really didn't want him to die. And there's, I'm sure there's people out there that are like, great, he's dead. We don't have to worry about this. New Adventures, who cares? But the other part of me is like, I kind of wasn't hating this, you know? <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's just my two cents. I will give you that. The art in this issue is beautiful. The characters look great. My problem is all the story. It does nothing really to advance the plot. It reiterates a couple things that we already learned. Um, and here again, this is a huge story. You've got six issues. You need to move this plot along. Like, the first issue let us in on some stuff. The third issue lets us in on a lot of stuff. And this issue mm -hmm. just kind of like rehashes what the first issue already told us. Um, but this time from anti-He-Man's point of view, which... I'm sorry, you're, you've only got so many issues. You've limited yourself to six issues. We don't need rehashing. We'll go grab our copies of issue one, which is what I do. Every time I get a new issue comes, I sit down and I read every issue up to that point. And then I read the new issue. Um, my biggest problem here, though, is that they just didn't do research on new adventures. Um, eh, eh, that's it, plain and simple. Um, Tim Seeley, he's a good writer. You can tell in the first issue he did his research. In the third issue he did research. He did not research this. Um, you know, you've got, you've got new adventures t characters talking about Serpos and, uh, you know, stuff like that, that they would have no idea about because that is an Eternian mythology and they are from Primus. Um, I know I'm going to sound like I'm nitpicking here, but um, you've got you've got Adam being referred to as Prince Adam, which he is not. He is a prince on Eternia, but when he goes to Primus in the New Adventures, his disguise there is as a merchant from... Uh, uh, Leviton, and he is Master Sebrian's nephew, who there's not the royalty on Primus. He would not be a prince. Um, and just, just little things like that throughout. Flog talks like a pirate for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's odd. He, 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 do he doesn't talk like that. Uh, and just little things like that that just goes, they didn't pay attention. And while the art is great, they look exactly like the classics figures. Um, I honestly would have preferred this to look like jet lag, especially since when Filmation gets its due, you can really tell that Dan... Or if they switch an artist, whoever's doing the art, really took the time to try and be filmation. Um, now that is actually a really good point. I didn't think of that yeah. until now. But yeah, you, you it basically making it look like the traditional cartoon. Yeah, uh, here here's one reason. Uh, just playing devil's advocate, Absolutely. not knowing if this is the case. If they would have done it looking like that animation, do you think people would have even bothered? Yes, because you're packed into a six issue miniseries. Um, that would be the that'd be for the hardcore people who want to get it versus casual people who are thinking about it, but then going, "You mean I got to get that for issue two If they didn't like New Adventures, you know. But I mean, and you could you could still you could still find a halfway point, I guess. He still you still could have done like He Man, for instance. Um, take take this take the emblem off his harness. 
make the lines a little simpler. Like, he still could have done it in his style, but not the classic style. Maybe find a medium, or maybe even look back at that first mini-comic, or the Bruce Timm yeah. mini-comics. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying, like, completely imitate it, because as we've seen... Uh, and I'll just jump ahead here. Everyone's read this, right? You you paused us and you went back and read it. I mean, <laughs> let, let, I mean, here's the. I hope that's lining up good. I mean, here's the glimpse of filmation we get in issue three. I mm-hmm. mean that that does not look like it just jumped out at of the tune. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also doesn't look like anti Eternia He Man standing there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like I said, the yeah. art is great. I don't mind it, but there is that argument to be made. How come Filmation gets its own style and they don't? And I will say that they might be switching artists on that issue because uh, I did jump ahead and look. In issue three here, it does say that pencils are done by Dan Fraga and Tom Derenick. Yes. So maybe Tom's doing the Filmation issue, and that's the reason for the the abrupt shift. Um but to Actually, me, do it, do it one way or another. You know, either go all updated Dan Fraga or, you know, jump the art styles to try and match the era a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to me, it makes it... The whole thing feels like the my problem with New Adventures that everyone wants to treat it like it's not important. Well, we're going to make Flog t- talk like this because I think it'd be cool if he talked like a pirate, even though he didn't. Um, Mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna use updated designs because we think they're cooler which they are um Mm -hmm. uh we're gonna use serpos because we heard that that's a thing on eternia we're gonna say prince adam because we know he's a prince even though these people wouldn't Mm -hmm. um it just it feel uh, compared to issue one and especially the 2000x issue and where it looks like they're going with filmation it just feels like there was less research done in the writing, um, and I just wish they'd done a little more, kept it a little truer to New Adventures itself, rather than it just being a pit stop along the way is what it feels like. The the one thing that I do know as um, it was an actually, oh boy, it was actually an error, is um, the, the letter actually did Serpos instead of the name of the god on Primus. And that's actually something Tim Seeley admitted on the other podcast tomorrow. Really? So that, that is, that's a mistake. I know that because he, I don't remember the name of the god on there though. It's, it's, there's like an S to it or something or is it? I, see, I feel bad. I don't know the name, but I, I know he he actually admitted no. He wrote it right, but then when they saw Serpos in one thing, and then the other name. Oh, did we drop the, the ball there? You good? Are you good? You froze up. Everything else is fine. I'm um, I'm I'm okay for now. I I actually had a call come through. I don't know if that was part of it. Okay. All right, well, you're so, back now. I will apologize um, to Tim Seeley for that then. Um, no, I, I, I'm i just – I know he mentioned that on the other podcast I'm on and because and, and, that was a big contention you too. T- you guys had Tim Seeley too? We had Tim Seeley after issue two, yeah. And then we just had Dan Frege again this past weekend. So I'm behind. Like <laughs> no, I said, it's all right. Like it's I said, right. there. I also have to go to a different uh, podcast app than what I normally use for for my podcast, so I, I'm usually behind on there. Nah, it's it's okay because honestly, like Tim Seeley had so much to say about this stuff that it, it, it overwhelmed <laughs> me to listen. But I remember that part especially. Um, yeah. Other than that, I actually your your arguments. I kind of dig the you know making it look like the other cartoon if they're doing filmation, looking the way filmation does. At least yeah. I didn't even think of that. Like I said, do, um, do it all or nothing. Stop stop treating this canon like it doesn't matter. And I know there were some people upset about that. That mm-hmm. it looked like the classics figure rather than you know something a little closer. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, as far as what I liked, I really liked the Skeletor Keldor interactions. Yeah, um, I th- I think that was really nice. Their their dialogue. Uh, that was that was about the big part for me. Is is the, these few pages where they're talking, um, you know, and even even here they kind of make it like it's after 
it's kind of a late like they've got all the mutants locked up on the starship skeletor and flog are kind of already not speaking to each other which also goes against so if you're saying this is at a time after the mutants are defeated well at the end of the series that series actually had a ending where there was a peace treaty and the mutants and and the uh the people of primus like laid down their arms and they went back to denebria and everybody else stayed so and that's when skeletor and flog had had the split skeletor and krita went on their own Mm -hmm. so if you're saying this is after the peace treaty then you know why are they all locked up and they're transporting them back to primus and it just it's little things like that that fly in the face of the established canon if you're going to set it afterwards they wouldn't be locked up and they wouldn't be taking them to primus Um, and the the beauty of me right now is I'm getting educated because my knowledge of this is so slim to none that when we get to that, it's going to be, a, I'm going to go to school. Basically yeah. I'm going to be schooled through this whole thing. Um, Cause I didn't, I didn't know any of that kind of stuff about the series, but I mean, I think out of, out of the issues, that issue probably is the one that it's like the art shines, the character design using the classics look work for the most part, but there really isn't a huge amount of essential story other than Keldor gets to meet a version of himself that is a decrepit version of himself. And he gets to see, you know, this is what he's done to get the power he's craved and everything. So he gets to kind of see like a mirror universe. This, this could be you if you go down the path. And that's pretty much the highlight of the issue. And, and then you move on from there and, we get our glimpse of uh, 2000X MYP uh, Evil Warriors at the end of it. Yeah, no, it is. It's yeah, basically just read this issue for the Skeletor Keldor moment. And uh, like I said, I, I I get that anti He Man is supposed to be un- unstoppable, never been defeated. Sure, um, but they've still done a job here in the first two issues, really, of making it seem too effortless uh especially his fight with new adventures he-man is basically like one hit and then it kills him like they didn't even get a chance to put up a fight um i just i i I would like to see somebody actually stand up to anti-he-man at some point even if they end up failing you know obviously he's gonna he's gonna defeat them i i'd still like it to look like there's a little bit of effort going in to stop him. But that, that's, I think that's my biggest complaint about how this is going is I need to have a measurement of what his real ability is versus what I conceive of it in my head. And in my head, I picture him kind of like a Michael Myers version of, of key man where he's this unstoppable killing machine and he will just be unrelenting and he probably won't say much. Like I always pictured him as he just, just is this force. And instead he's like, he's taking time to talk to people. He's helping them to explain his mentality. And I know that you need to do that to an extent, but there's an element of like, I just like the idea that he's mowing down people and he's evil because evil, they don't need to explain themselves. And that makes it scarier in some ways. And instead, it's like this whole different version of him. Like I said, my head cannon's a little different. And no, I'd like to see him being tested too. I'd like to see him go up against the He Man that he's going to have to blink, you know, in that way. But well, and that's it. He's he he is the He Man of Anti Eternia, so mm-hmm. he should be. They should be pretty equal on power level, even if. Maybe he's got the edge because he's already absorbed some of the power swords out there, Mm -hmm. um, which is what tips it in his favor. But like, you don't feel that. You don't feel. Whereas they should be trading blow for blows. I know. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a specific story, but to to do the Superman analogy, um, I know I've read stories with him where he comes up against something really powerful, and he even makes comments like, "Oh, I don't have to hold back with you." Mm -hmm. Like that's how I feel. This is. Filmation He-Man was very much like that. There were uh, the episode, um, oh, where they find the, uh, oh, the Eternium out in the desert. 
Oh man, this is gonna bug me now. Um, but and he trap jaw gets really powerful and he busts through a mountain and He Man goes like, Well that was me before I learned how to control my powers, like mm -hmm. like because they're good, they're always holding back a little bit. And so this yeah. could have been that moment where it's like, Wow, I don't have to hold back with you and you actually see what He Man's really capable of mm -hmm. as he's maybe even you know, even a good parallel would be like the Superman Doomsday fight. Like like this is it, they feel it's all out and in the end it's not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really don't think it will be enough that one He-Man will not be enough to stop this this creature, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I would like to see a little more, little more fight. Um, but yeah, other than that, there's really not a lot going on here. Uh, 87 He-Man and Tappers are, you know, they stop the starship from crashing. Um, they have to hold their breath, even though no one else in this issue in space had to. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, even even here, it's just these little things that bug me, especially in this issue. He's talking to New Advent Anti He Man's talking to New Adventures He Man as he's killing him, and he's you know New Adventures asks him what happened to you, and he says, "I held aloft the magic sword." I said, by the power of Hell Skull, and the secrets of the universe were revealed to me. And then that one page later, when he's combining the two swords, he says, by the power of Grey Skull. It's mm. like, yeah. It's just those those little things. And you can't even you can't even run the argument of uh of well, he's he's saying it because he's merging the other sword. Because if you're you're in New Adventures Land now, this is by the power of Eternia. <laughs> so, oh, uh, I, I and they scared. they even they even take <laughs> pains in this issue. That's one thing they got right. They say the power now resides in the starship, which yeah. as we read, and you know, you guys don't know what we're talking about because we lost that episode. But in the first mini comic of New Adventures, the power of Grayskull was transferred into Starship Eternia, and that's why he yep. started saying by the power of Eternia. Mm -hmm. um, so either way, he got it wrong. It's not what he says. It's not what He Man in this universe would say. It's just those little errors in this issue, especially. I got done with this, and I was just like, uh, um, I uh, jumping back real quick. I like how Skeletor. Uh, sees what they say is the truth, and then anti-attorney He-Man kills him. So it's, it tells you there's something more at play here that we get into a little bit in issue three here. Um, mm -hmm. But that's like the only glimpse of we're building on the story, and this is at the end. Like I said, the, the Guardians and the, the He-Men and Keldor from the other dimension have no interaction. Um, mm -hmm. It, just, it, it feels very much like, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's nice seeing uh, Skeletor steal some power from Keldor, and it kind of gives him the white in his hair, like how mm -hmm. we've always known Keldor since the 2000X series. Mm -hmm. um, and he takes the staff once Skeletor dies um, to help focus his power. And so you kind of got this feeling, and in the next issue here, in the back of your head, like, was this the best idea to bring a Keldor along? Yeah. Because I, I do like that progress here where we're kind of seeing Keldor on the road to being Skeletor. Which, mm -hmm. uh, we'll see if that's for the best or not. <laughs> um, so issue three, we get to start off with uh, there's been speculation about this for a while, mm -hmm. and I, I'm amused that they kind of tip their hat to it. The whole idea of the Zodak core, like the Green Lantern core in this opening page. And even Spectre shows up, the mighty Spectre. <laughs> Take that as you will, if you like him or hate him, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh... I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's, we're starting off strong with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on one second, Sean. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, no, there. I don't mind Spector being here. Sure, make him, make him a, a cosmic enforcer. Why not? 
Yeah. Uh, it doesn't bother me. The character's never bothered me as much as some other people. I, whatever. He's he's a part of the the the, what, the creator's choice or whatever. He he exists. Yep. Um, I like this better than him being like an agent of time travel. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's 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 throwaway. Um, here again, though, I wish they'd done a little bit more to differentiate. Because here again, everybody, I mean, I don't recognize the, the female Zodak up top. I think she was newly created. Um, someone will correct me if I'm wrong. You might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, uh, Dan Frega on the last ish episode of the other podcast said that, that her name is Apocrypha or Apocrypha or something. And I think she's newly created because they. Oh, she is newly created. I think, uh, yeah, he basically said there's too many men. Let's put, throw a woman Zodak in there. Sure. Maybe she is in there. I don't know. But uh, from know. what I heard, she's created specifically for that panel. Yeah, that's that's what I figured. Um, yeah, I don't see anything in here. Yeah, I figured she was. Um, but then the one to the left of our traditional Zodak, that's actually Xanthor from the Filmation episode Golden Discs of Knowledge. Um, and then you've got Strobo to the right of him. Well, our right. Um, mm-hmm. He was from the UK co- annuals or comics. Um, and then obviously down below you've got Spector in the purple. Um, and then Zodak with a K from the 2000X show. And mm-hmm. here again, I guess, like, here again, they, not the heart back on it, rewind it if you want to hear it again, but like Xanthor, and that's obviously Filmation, S, kind of Filmation merged with the toy, um, because he's got the gloves and the boots, but he's definitely not Filmation-y like we see in the last panel of this issue. Mm-hmm. Um, so here again, if these are supposed to be Zodaks from around the multiverse joined together, you know... Same thing. Either pick an art style or don't pick an art You know, give everyone a little more uniqueness. Whereas here, they kind of classicize them all, making them look the similar. Um, but I did enjoy seeing this brief interlude of he- anti-He-Man traveling through wor- through um, what they call it, the inter-realm. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than what it seems like, like he's just popping in from place to place. It shows he actually has a journey. So our heroes do have a chance to get ahead of him, mm-hmm. or at least catch up to him. So, and then after that, we're basically into, you know, just a quick summary of the issue here. They go into the 2000X world. The Horde and the Snakemen have joined together against Skeletor, who now controls Grayskull and has banished all the Masters to another dimension. Um, and and. Uh, our He-Men and Keldor uh, end up in this world. Uh, they all get caught up in a bat. Uh, Anti-He-Man joins forces with the Horde and Snake Men to break into Grayskull so that he can get the Power Sword. And uh, the other He-Men and Keldor kind of join up with Skeletor to try and defend the castle um, in a roundabout way. Um, obviously... Uh, Anti-He-Man wins again, and he moves on to the next world. Um, yeah, so basically it's the same thing. I did enjoy this more. I felt like it, it it let you into a little bit more, and it felt like it's going somewhere again. This this issue re- actually renewed uh, uh, my excitement for the next issue. Like, okay, we're going somewhere now. Things are happening, so... Yeah, and your argument about the, you know, where does it take place in the New Adventures line in that story is now, well, at least in this issue, we know this is after the cartoon has ended. Right. And Skeletor is one. And it, it, it actually sets up the whole, well, what happens? You know, like, what, how did he win? And you get to have the knowledge of here's how he did it, which I, th- I thought was actually kind of fun. Because one of the things about both Filmation and uh, the 2000X show is he has these one-off plans. And each time he does it, he, he's going after an artifact. So in, in the Mike Young series, he goes after, in one episode, he goes after the Diamond Ray of Disappearance and fails. He goes after the Ramstone. He goes after a bunch of different things. 
And each time he thinks, oh, well, that didn't work. I'm getting rid of it. And instead, this version of Skeletor is like, I'm keeping it. And I'm going to add it to my powers. So I'm going to have all of these things at my disposal, not just I'm trying it as a one-off idea. So I kind of dug that uh, aspect of it where each time he fails, it didn't mean he fails. It's just he acquired something. He's like the anti-attorney of He-Man collecting all the power swords with the artifacts on the MYP Eternia. Um, so that I kind of I, I kind of appreciated because – you know, Skeletor really didn't get a whole lot of do in the second season of the MYP show. He got eaten up by uh, the snake men, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so, yeah, um, absolutely. so I, I like that. I, I like that this Skeletor is one where he gets everything he wants and he's empty. And that's kind of fun to see, you know, he's always been after the power. And now that he has it, it's like, it's not it. It doesn't do it for him. But there is that one line where he goes, "Let's go back to Castle Grayskull." And no, I'm never going to be sick of hearing that. You know? <laughs> yeah, this one definitely for me. Same thing. It felt, it felt more serious. It felt like they were really, really taking this era seriously. They did their research. They're basing mm-hmm. it in that proposed third, fourth season, whatever. After the Horde comes. Um, yeah. And you really feel like this could happen, like this could be the continuation of the 2000X series. Yeah. Um, you know, just the, the little things. I like seeing the Horde in there. I like that they were able to include Shadow Weaver, which they could never do back in the day. Um, I, I do. You can definitely tell that he's pulling from references that he finds um, because and I couldn't I couldn't not see it. In this, the one panel there, Hordak is exactly his staction pose. Yeah. Like, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, little things like that bothered me. But, um, you know, anti-He-Man here, he's showing that he is. I know it goes against what you felt anti-He-Man was, but here it shows that he really is a dark reflection of He-Man. He's very cunning, he's very smart, and he knows mm-hmm. to get into here. He realizes how powerful this Skeletor is here, uh, how much power he has at his disposal, and he's going to need help. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to say here, I and I have a feeling a lot of people might have regarded this as an error, um, is when it flashes to Eternia and it says the Snake Zone. Um, I have a feeling people probably regarded that as a mistake, but if you actually look at that picture, and they probably could have done a better job showing it, there are some very fright zone uh, constructs there in the foreground. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think what they were implying there is that the Snake Men and the Horde have joined forces and they've created yeah. this thing. But I have a feeling there are probably some fans out there like, oh man, they can't even get the name of Snake Mountain right. <laughs> um, maybe there's not, but I just want to point that out. I, I wish we could have gotten a cooler, a better, wider, or bigger shot of that, because um, it definitely looks cool. Um, and mm-hmm. it kind of goes back into that DC thing of where, uh, like, the, the Horde plants fright zones around the world, which I really like that concept back during the Eternity yeah. War. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the, I did, oh yeah, my other little nitpick uh, was King Hiss doing the Superman uh, reveal to do his to do his second yeah, skin. Yeah, um, yeah. Eh. <laughs> but I, I did feel they did more research here than they did with the last one. Um, they used the disco Skeletor design for Skeletor powered up with the power of Grayskull, which yeah. I'm okay with that because, you know, especially with them saying all the universes are different, I'd hate to see like the god Skeletor from the movie show up here because we're, we're establishing that they're different. Yeah. So that's that's probably the best design they could have used if they wanted to show a powered up Skeletor, and he does honestly do a good job here, where it's not as gaudy as the actual figure is. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. he keeps the face as the normal color and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I, this this artwork, especially in this issue, mm-hmm. is really well done. They did a good job of of it feeling like the two thousand X series. So. Yeah, uh, I got the alarm, so I got to head out in about probably five minutes, but okay. I'll throw in my, my quick uh, things re- here at the end. Um, yeah, he I think Dan Frega only did the first 11 pages and then Tom Derenick took over okay. for this issue. So, that's so where he took over. 
it's pretty much like right around when He-Man comes in. And okay. and you get to see the bearded He-Man with yeah. the snake armor. Which for me, I was grinning from ear to ear because it's freaking 2000X He-Man for the first time in years. And he represented. Um, and and we, we get to have uh, the Tapper's death. Which I'm sure you weren't that upset by because i know you're not the biggest fan <laughs> nope and, not at all uh, and, and uh, i think i've done real quick here i know i know we're running out of time but real quick you notice i've ignored him basically this whole thing because i think that's the best thing to do well um, he I, shouldn't have been there uh he was a throwaway character the only reason he's there is because spider ham was such a big hit in the spider-man movie yeah i agree and I agree. they felt that this was the, but yeah he could completely disappear i felt Honestly, I didn't even feel anything when he died. Even that scene itself was just like, eh, they finally did yeah. it. And when he should they have been cannon fodder issues ago. And that's all <laughs> I'll say on Tappers. <laughs> but I, I guess for me, it, it like you said, it was a natural progression of 2000X, so it felt good to revisit that, uh, that show. And I am going to be completely honest and selfish. He-Man didn't die. That made me thrilled that the 2000X He-Man is still out there, you know? And... I want that was the thing I wanted to tell you when I got the issue, and I, I was like, "No, I'm waiting for the I'm waiting until we record." But that was that was probably the thing that made me the happiest fanboy of the year right now is 2000 X He Man is still out there, and I will say one of my favorite moments really quick is the the switch around part where Skeletor had all of his guys, but then he decides he needs help and he switches the fact that he takes his men puts them into the other dimension where the masters are and the masters show up to be the ones to go up against anti attorney a he-man in that one scene. And I love that. That was cool. Yeah, that was, he flipped the script as you say, you know, he did. And it was nice to see all the masters back. They used, they, and uh, it was cool to see some designs that weren't used. Like they had spike or in the evil warriors panel, which mm-hmm. is based on the four horsemen's concept that never got made. Um, you get to see Snout Spout here, who does not get enough do. He is an awesome character. <laughs> um, and a, a miscolored Moss Man. I don't know if you caught that, but right below... I did not. Right below Snout Spout, <laughs> it's Moss Man colored like Beast Man. Um, but yeah, the, and the, the darkness of this issue of He-Man, basically, you think he got banished with everybody, but he didn't. He's actually been wandering like a ghost, like a spirit... Of Grayskull, mm-hmm. around Grayskull this whole time, having to watch Skeletor rule and not mm-hmm. being able to do anything. Um, and this is the one version of He-Man where I feel like, yeah, like that could happen. I don't want to make mm-hmm. it sound like he's weaker, but just the way the 2000X series handled him, it feels like that he, that like, this would be the He-Man to fail and come back. Like, filmation, it wouldn't happen. Just the way that's set up, it wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. But it feels like a natural progression here. Um, mm-hmm. It was nice seeing Modulock and Shadow Weaver. Um, really, guys, check out this issue. I really enjoyed this. Um, yeah, it's worth it. And I will say, though, that even this powerful, before he ends up losing the power, it's the last thing Skeletor does before he loses the power of Grayskull, um, is is banish all these warriors, but you see he's still not powerful enough to banish anti-He-Man. Mm-hmm. Anti-He-Man's still standing there, and he banishes the Horde and the Snake Men. So that shows you how powerful anti-He-Man's becoming now. After assuming, he says in this issue, I've got the power of hundreds of Gray Skulls at this point. Yeah. So all these little pocket universes, ones we may have never even seen, he's already conquered them. So it's really coming down to... The end here, you can you can feel that the, he's now going after you'd say the most powerful or the biggest the biggest ones, you know. And they even talk about getting to the power prime, which I've got to assume mm-hmm. is going to be the Alcala universe, um, probably because that was the first. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he banishes all the other evil warriors to hell, and Anti He Man makes his own escape into the Filmation universe. Um, <laughs> What's this new hell? <laughs> yeah, Tappers is dead. Everyone else, is, you know, He-Man and Tila reunited. It's yeah, I can really see this being the end of 2000X, um, and not really even the end. It just gets rid of the the Snake Men and the Horde. So you could still even say like, okay, now it's back to He-Man and Skeletor, which is something I always felt the 2000X show needed to do. 
Agreed. Um, so yeah. So real quick, if you got time, uh, let's uh, final rating. First three issues. First three issues. I'd give them. I, I mean, I love my 2000X. I'd give it a seven out of ten at this point. The I I feel like there's still stuff that would be interesting to explore, but for what we have, I feel like it's it's interesting enough as it is for the time being. Right. I'm I'm gonna play I'm gonna play it real safe here. First three issues, and I will change this once I have all six issues. Well, I might change. It, I might not. But this is not final rating. Um, I'm gonna go straight five out of ten. Um, all three issues together, it kind of. It wa- it's a mm-hmm. wash for me at this point. Uh, issue one's decent. Issue two is subpar. And issue three to me is, is this is a story I was hoping to see all along where we really get to see the universes and, you know, really get to see the horror of anti-He-Man. So, yep. Um, yeah. So I know you got to... Got yeah, I got a jet. I got two alarms now. I got to get going. So. All right. So All right. I'll just leave it right there. Yeah, uh, check us out, like, subscribe, share, and until next time. Until next time. Yeah.